moving knowledge to practice. I want to talk a little bit about um, where we've been in the last six, six months or so, and more importantly, where we want to go with the Land Use Knowledge Network. Um, it's been an interesting uh, learning experience as much as anything to try and put all the pieces together to, to prepare us for what the next six months is going to be, which is, is moving at a lot faster pace. And I'd uh, just like to acknowledge, before I start, that Neil McAlpine is uh, helping me as a co-management function uh, uh, on this, and, and his support has been invaluable. We've also added, just recently, Terry McHugh, who's uh, our library and researcher, who's going to be working with the FRI staff in, in uh, Hinton. And so it's now a, a solid group of three with, uh, with significant support from, from Sean and, and other folks at, at FRI. So the team is starting to come together to be able to, uh, to move forward on, on what is a really ambitious initiative. If you look at the uh, land use knowledge, or the land use framework, strategy six, identified that there was a critical need to be able to share high quality information and knowledge to be able to support effective land use decision making and planning. And the, uh, the framework also identified that we needed to think about this as a knowledge system. And a knowledge system not only focused on the research or knowledge generation side, but the collection, sharing, management, and most importantly, the application of that information. So we needed to think about this as, a, as an integrated system and all of those elements uh, needed to be looked at. As well, the framework was quite progressive in my mind at looking at the idea of focusing on networks as a way to facilitate that, which showed that it's more than just thinking about this as a web page where you, you try and put all the information. It's much more about engaging with the critical people and networks and associations and organizations and all of those people that are involved. And so the idea of supporting networks was the essence of, of the, the land use frameworks way that they were going to support knowledge sharing and application. And so when you look at the mission, uh, there's just two things I want to highlight really briefly. There's two critical parts to that. One obviously is the access side. How do we provide access to high quality knowledge on a just-in-time basis uh, to be able to support people? But the other piece was just as important, which is the capacity side. How do we engage and enhance the capacity throughout the province in the land use sector to be able to not only create but be able to be apply knowledge? And I want to get back to that capacity piece a little bit later because it's a critical piece of what we want to do. So as we put together the plan, we thought about it as, as three really integrated uh, elements. Obviously, you have to think about the knowledge resources, the content, um, the, the evidence, the knowledge that needs to be made available, and how to be able to provide that. So that starts to look like a virtual library and a web presence. You need to have the network connections, the ability to connect people who are um, who are involved in land use uh, issues, and be able not only have be able to identify those networks, but to be able to share among those networks. And the final piece was we needed to think about knowledge generation. But it was very clear when we, and from both the land use knowledge, land use framework, but also when we started to conceptualize this, that it wasn't generation in the classic way that it's a research project. It was more going back to Boyer's work on scholarship reconsidered, if you've, if you've done, read that, that work, that, that talked about four types of knowledge generation. There's discovery, which is research, but there's also integration, application, and teaching. And the integration and application side is a critical place where we felt that we could really add value. So it's, it's working out with, obviously, the researchers, but to, to look at cross disciplinarity to be able to integrate that work, and most importantly, be able to apply it in useful ways that people could be able to use. So all three of those pieces are closely integrated and part of our, our strategy. So what I want to talk about today is kind of three, three themes that uh, would highlight where we want to go. The connections piece, working with networks. The capacity piece, what it's going to take to build the underlying infrastructure and technology. And the final piece around the wicked problems theme that, uh, that we've established and want to build on. So connections. If you think about um, connections as being uh, excuse me, my right piece of paper here. Um, the idea of networks is that we already know that there are lots of networks that already exist. And the land use knowledge network then isn't about creating new networks, um, which might superimpose uh, the existing ones. It's much more about creating and linking networks uh, that already exist and trying to find ways for them to better collaborate and better uh, leverage the kind of work that they're already doing. We are in this existing ecosystem. Um, we are the new kid on the block, and it's an interesting strategy about how do you, as a new, new person entering into this system, uh, become accepted, make a difference, 
and, and uh, make a contribution. And so we went back to think about some of the, the evidence and, and the science related to networks itself and have glommed on to the idea of social capital. And if you think of social capital as that's three essential dimensions that you want to be looking at related to that. One is that there are already existing structural ties that exist within that network. It's critical then to be able to identify those ties and those linkages. You need to have shared understanding, so be able to have a common understanding of some of the issues and themes and challenges that, are, that all of those pieces are engaged in. But most importantly, you need to be able to build trust. And trust is something that's um, incredibly fragile, but once it's created, it can be a very, very powerful approach. But we know that building trust takes time. So as we thought about what does it take to build trust, we've come up with a simple diagram, but obviously lots of moving pieces, that in, it starts with the idea of building and creating relationships. Make, and Neil and, and I, to a lesser extent, but have been talking to everybody and anybody who's interested and involved or tangentially or, or intensely in the land use area. Working collaboratively to, to identify issues that we might commonly share and be able to work on. And then the third place is to find ways to collaborate. And we'll be talking more about examples as I work through the session, but that collaboration might be uh, to work together on some of their events and conferences, to provide speakers, and most importantly, to be able to uh, support them on our, our knowledge portal to be able to provide access to the high quality knowledge and evidence uh, that they need to be able to do their work. And we also established a number of principles that would help guide us. The first principle is we're not in this game to duplicate or replace the existing networks. And there have been some comments, you know, why are you here and, and are you at any threat to us? So that's a critical piece that we have to be very clear about. It's not our job to replace you, we want to, and we're not going to undermine you. What we want to do is be able to work with you to find ways to add value. And that involves, as I mentioned before, high trust relationships and also the ability to uh, engage in, in value-added collaboration. So. If we think about capacity, which is the idea of what does it take for us to build a really robust um, web presence, uh, there are a number of critical web design principles we're going through, and I want to just give you a quick demo of some of the web things that we're doing. But we focused on these kind of six interrelated people, uh, interrelated elements, sorry. One is to be able to provide engaging content, um, and the way we're doing that, as I'll show you in a minute, is around engaging themes that will be changing on an ongoing basis. The other is to be able to provide high quality information feeds. The work that Sean has done at FRI has already done some really, really leading work in this area to be able to provide really, really solid information from a variety of different places to be able to support uh, people's interest in, in information. And as the website gets um, up and running, we'll be able to not only put that on our website, but be able to direct that specifically to people based on their interests. To be able to offer user input for commentary, discussion, and other levels of engagement. To be able to provide rich content resources, which is slightly different than the engaging content because we know that the just-in-time, high-quality information that people are going to need, they're going to be able to want to drill down and find out the very, very specific um, knowledge that's going to be able to help them do that work. We need to be able to provide that resource. We need to have really, really robust search functions. All of us have used websites where we've typed in something on the search bar and, and um, gotten literally nothing of value. And we, we, we're going to build a really robust search tool that when you search a term, it's going to pull out the relevant information that you want. And finally, we need to be able to pro provide access to people. And there's going to be a whole um, content and contact management system where we're going to build, uh, people will register, we'll be able to provide profiles and list to the expert and access to the experts who are involved in the system. So the Knowledge Network uh, database or uh, web page site, which is launching on October 17th, we were hoping to have a soft launch available for you today, but we're still in the final kind of tweaking stages, is that's going to be kind of the look at the front page. And I'm going to switch to the next thing because it pulls out some of the elements. The, uh, the boxes over on the far left for you are where we're going to feature themes. What's a theme going to be like? Well, we've heard a number of them today that we would be profiling, obviously, that are going to be of high interest. Um, Neil is working on some work on reclamation issues in the boreal forest. We've got uh, some interesting work coming out of the our session on, on sage grouse in, in the grasslands related to oil and gas. So those are the kind of themes that we're going to be looking at. Lots of rich me multimedia and images are going to be part of the site. We're going to have a blog comprised of multiple different authors who are going to be giving 
insights on topical and, and uh, issues emerging in, in, the, uh, in the sector. As I mentioned before, lots of high quality information feeds and linked with lots of social media features. On the underplay of the, of the website as you scroll down, there's going to be search features uh, that will able to drill, allow you to drill deeply into our content uh, uh, management system, um, commentary as people putting on the, the links, plus newsletters and all sorts of other pieces. Related to that, the quality feeds is going to be a useful place, and I, these are going to be the same images, but we're going to be able to allow you to pull high quality information from the web, but most importantly, allow user input. So you can uh, like, dislike, make comments, um, and also have the system, if you will, learn on, on your behalf. So if you're interested in that document, it will be able to, to send that out and, and link you to more uh, information and send that to your website. As I mentioned, we've got, uh, to support that, we're adding full library and research uh, services that'll be fully occupied in trying to populate the website and to be able to respond to the emerging themes that are of issues. But perhaps the most innovative piece is what I want to talk about for just a minute is that we deliberately thought about the design of the website and we went to an open source tool called Drupal for a reason because when we've been talking to a number of organizations out there, one of the things they all say is, we've got a website, we don't have the time to keep it up to date, we don't have the resources uh, to maintain it or to keep it fresh, and could you guys help? And so one of the things about Drupal is that it can handle multiple different websites on the same content management system. So, and those are just examples, but um, we've been talking to a number of organizations who are saying, well, if we could have our own facing website but be able to use your content management, there would be obvious benefits. We would be able to, to share the information that was part of the, uh, the system and to be able to leverage that and have multiple uh, ways of, of bringing people together but also sharing the, the knowledge that we're all collecting. So what we're going to be doing is, is using our, our content management system as a way to be able to provide dedicated and what will seem like standalone websites for multiple different organizations all helping to serve each other. We think there's going to be significant interest in that but also um, the cross fertilization of, of the high quality knowledge that's going to be available there will help everybody out. And that was one of the, the, real, the overall goals of the initial proposal was that we want to be able to find ways to build capacity in the system as a whole and, and this is part of it by, by facilitating better sharing. The third and final piece I want to talk about uh, quickly is the idea of wicked problems. When we had the session actually in this room uh, in June, we, Dr. Lee Foote talked about wicked problems and the, the challenges that they face in, in uh, the land use system. And when you think about wicked problems, the quick definition is out there, but it's a type of problem that is very, very difficult to solve because the information is incomplete or even contradictory and, and changing. And if you think about the issues that we face in the land use system, it's those wicked problems that are the most interesting but also the most challenging. And so it makes a lot of sense for all of us, and given the presentations we've already seen today, all of those would be examples, if you will, of wicked problems. That's the area that we want to focus on. But there's one other dimension of wicked problems that's, that's particularly important, is that the ways that we typically address wicked problems, or, or problems um, that aren't wicked, but in a very logical, rational way, we think we can work through all the steps and come up with the right answer and solve the issue, is in fact not effective. So we need to find actually new techniques to be able to address how we work with wicked problems, and that's part of the capacity building piece that we think is the critical part of, of some of the value we can add. So I want to provide one quick example, and I've deliberately chosen this example because it's very different than, than what you've seen before, but very much part of the large framework of things that we need to be able to look at related to the land use um, knowledge network, which is going to deal with both in, or environmental, social, and economic issues. So we're starting early work with the Community Planning Association of Alberta on their Complete Communities Conference. And one of their really, really significant challenges in rural Alberta is affordable housing. When you think about affordable housing, it serves as a type of wicked problem because people tend to default, well, we just need to provide more low interest loans, or we just need as the town of whatever to make more uh, low cost lots available, or we need to increase uh, rental housing. But in fact, when you look at an issue like affordable housing, there's multiple different perspectives that can and should be looked at to be able to come up with some, some more thoughtful responses. So our way of adding value is to be able to bring 
some deep thinking into all of those different areas to be able to work with the, the Community Planning Association to be able to present that in a useful way that people are going to be able to find value. So the process looks a little bit like that. Um, once we find an issue and work with the association on some preliminary scoping, we found a really, really useful um, crowdsourcing tool that will allow us to have widespread user engagement to be able to start to, to explore issues using an online um, uh, multiple step uh, research tool. And, that will and then we merge that with some of the, the latest thinking that we find through our research that will allow us to eventually develop new tools and resources to be able to, be able to support decision makers um, a, as they're doing this work. So as we're working on the wicked problems, it's a very highly collaborative approach, and it's an approach that, that brings together the best thinking, but the best experiences in the field to be able to provide richer sources of, of new understanding. In doing so, it will also help to build capacity itself. So my final slide is just to say that this whole exercise in some ways is a wicked problem. Uh, the idea of developing effective knowledge networks is something that lots of people talk about, but it's still very much work in progress. So as part of our research agenda, um, we need to be able to think about how do we best do this? What's the best way to be able to pull together the highest quality information and knowledge, but not only to make it available, to, but to help transfer and apply that. And one of the things that we're finding is there's some really interesting work happening in the world of design and design thinking that it allows a better way to take a more user-focused approach, to think about multiple different strategies, and to do it as a learning experience as we, we move forward. So for, for Neil and I and the other people involved in this process, our wicked problem is how do we make the land use knowledge network work and to, to make it effective. And so it's a learning journey that we're on. Thank you very much for your time.